Um, 2013 is when Sarah Micklejohn at UCSD uh, was like, hmm, I don't, you know, uh, she was a brilliant, you know, cryptography researcher, but she had not really looked at cryptocurrency. And she was like, you know, I wonder if this stuff is as anonymous as, as people think it is. Um, and she took almost like this anthropological approach. Like, I wonder if I can just figure out like what people are doing with cryptocurrency. Uh, maybe I can just like figure out how many people even are using it, which nobody knew really. And <clears throat> she was the one who came up with these clustering techniques, um, basically like a few clever tricks to show like um, that, you know, certain addresses all must belong to the same person or mm. organization. Like one is if, you know, to spend Bitcoins from an address, I don't know if you want to get into these like nerdy details, you tell me when to stop. Yeah. But like to spend Bitcoins from a Bitcoin address, you have to have the private key for that address. Right. And so um, if you create a multi-input transaction, as it's called, which like sounds complicated, but it's really just like sending um, Bitcoins from lots of addresses at once in one transaction, then you must control the private keys for all those addresses. Right. That means like you look at that multi-input transaction and you say, oh, all these addresses must have belonged to one person or to one service. And if you then like take that sort of filter like lens and like look at the whole blockchain for every multi-input transaction, you can immediately start to create clusters that show, oh, she, I think like she she showed like right away, oh, there are there are maximum half as many people here or services as there are Bitcoin addresses. She like cut the whole blockchain in half. Right. And it's complex an algorithm to Exactly. Yeah. And then like that's that's that was trick number one, kind of like an easy one. Then she came up with her own, like that. In fact, that was something that was kind of like an open secret in the crypto world uh, already at that point. Um, but then she came up with another one, which is like that when you spend bitcoins with many wallets, uh, you basically cannot spend a fraction of the coins in an address. You kind of like crack open the piggy bank, like the whole piggy bank of that address, and you send all the coins to whoever you intend. So like receive part part of them and then you get back change at an, at a different address mm -hmm. and that can make it like really difficult to follow the money because you don't know which is the recipient address and which is the change address but she realized oh well the change address very often is recognizable because it's the new address the one that was just like created to receive the change the recipient address sometimes is, has been used before or it's old so you know with that algorithm that like little trick she applied that across the blockchain and then could find like, oh, I can see like, here's like a fork in the road where everybody else didn't know how to follow the money, but I can follow it. I can follow it to the change address. And mm. it's, that still belongs to the first person sending the money. That's his address. In fact, all of these change addresses are his address. I can sort of like follow this wad of cash as it like, as bills are peeled off and handed to somebody and it keeps getting like taken back by the spender and put in a different pocket, but it's the same wad of bills. You know, and then eventually you see that that wad of bills like sent to a cryptocurrency exchange to be cashed out, and there you can send a subpoena. She right. knows like the law enforcement agency can send a subpoena to that exchange and identify somebody. So like already she's like building like powerful tricks to follow the money and identify people that were not you know uh, previously like obvious to anybody in this world. And then she also, as you said, started doing these undercover transactions, basically, where, you know, she would put money into the Silk Road and take it out again. She never actually bought anything on the Silk Road, she says, um, but like she could have, obviously. And and doing those undercover deals, she can see which addresses she's interacting with. And every time mm -hmm. she does that, she can sometimes like say, oh, this address belongs to the Silk Road. It's part of this big cluster. So that whole cluster is the Silk Road. Now I've identified like a million Silk Road addresses right. and I can see everybody interacting with them. Each one of those is a drug deal. You know, that is so powerful. And it was the first like real, like massive hole blown in this myth of Bitcoin's anonymity. That paper came out in late 2013. T. Gringabarian read it before he traced these two corrupt agents money. Right. Michael Groninger read it before he built a, a tool that like automated all these tricks, mm -hmm. you know, and um, started selling that to law enforcement. So that's like the true uh, kind of like, you know, aha moment, right? Like this is possible. <clears throat> and, and then soon Chainalysis was the one that really built it into a company. I mean, so were they, were, were, was Chainalysis, was their sole 
premise just to work with the government and to help them trace these criminal act this criminal activity or did they have some sort of other utility in the marketplace well the founder of, of chainalysis is a fascinating guy i mean there's a few founders but the the original like guy who um came up with the the idea of the company michael groniger mm -hmm. this danish guy he's a he's a fan of bitcoin and he like believed in bitcoin but from the very beginning he was like no this is not anonymous or untraceable like this mm -hmm. um I can, there's a whole blockchain here. You know, a, a, the blockchain is by definition like a list of every transaction, every right. Bitcoin transaction ever. It's just between addresses rather than any identity. So, mm. like these long convoluted like Bitcoin addresses don't look like they have anything to do with an identity in the real world. But he, and actually he was, he based a lot of his, uh, his first. Uh, software on the, the tricks that had been published by Sarah Micklejohn, this researcher at the University of California, San Diego. He saw that you could find patterns. He uh, rather, you know, Sarah found, and he like kind of took this further. You could find patterns in the blockchain. And then he built a piece of software that could essentially like um, implement these tricks to to create clusters to show that like sometimes thousands or even millions of addresses belonged to one person or service and to follow that money sometimes until it hit a cryptocurrency exchange where you know cryptocurrency exchanges where you trade bitcoins for dollars or vice versa they have know your customer requirements under us law they have to have identity mm -hmm. identity identifying information for their accounts mm -hmm. um but his idea in, in creating the first tool to trace cryptocurrency, which he called Reactor, was that he would sell this to exchanges, to like Bitcoin exchanges. He'd worked, he had helped to found an, another exchange. He was the CTO there, I think. And um, he left to create Chainalysis with the, in the hopes of helping exchanges just know who their customers all are, like help them understand, like to help them deal with these know your customer requirements, I think, in a kind of more automated way. Mm. Uh, like. You probably want to know if you're an exchange if you're helping to cash out dark web drug money right um you know at least like you may not want to know but <laughs> but like um if the government is demanding that you know this is an easy way to do it mm. so that was his first like idea to pit he pitched it to exchanges and eventually like a lot of them did buy it but his first customers to his surprise were law enforcement agencies wow and he actually was just like in san francisco and um was pitching this to exchanges and then like he, he a friend was like oh you should talk to this prosecutor who um introduced him to uh this agent with an irs criminal investigations in san francisco named tigreen gambarian who was in some ways like the central detective of of the book he was now, tigreen was the guy who came from soviet union yeah he, well, he, okay. he grew up <laughs> in armenia but then in post-soviet russia as well um had like a very tough childhood there i mean mm -hmm. like he truly like war-torn Armenia. Right. Um, and it's a very interesting character. Like IRS criminal investigations is a weird place. Like yeah. I don't think most Americans know about it even, but it's like this actual law enforcement agency within IRS. Um, and they, you know, I mean, they kind of have a chip on their shoulder about the fact that people don't even know this, but they, <laughs> they carry guns, they make arrests, they like carry out search warrants they travel around the world and like you know get people extradited to be prosecuted in the united states and stuff like you know they are um a full-blown law enforcement agency but like get no respect from the <laughs> fbi and dea or whoever um tigrin so tigrin was like you know um a forensic accountant who carried a gun and like was kind of a like this weird mix of like nerd and tough guy uh uh who also had looked at Bitcoin from the beginning and um, saw him also like, there's this blockchain here. I don't believe this can be anonymous. I can see these transactions. And, you know, his first, he was actually the first to ever show that it was possible to trace Bitcoin within law enforcement. And this, mm -hmm. this was not in the Silk Road case in the traditional sense, but actually in the wake of the bust of Ross Ulbricht, which did not actually use cryptocurrency tracing. He was identified through other mistakes he'd made. Um, Tigrin Gambarian basically like sat down, looked at the blockchain and showed that a DEA agent and a secret service agent who were involved in the investigation of the Silk Road had stolen money from the Silk Road in like as corrupt cops, basically. Actually, one of them had sold law enforcement information to the Dread Pirate Roberts 
One of them uh, had stolen hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of Bitcoin from the Silk Road. But they these were two federal agents who, in their own investigation of the Silk Road, had thought that they could use the, you know, the false promise of this this fake idea that Bitcoin is untraceable, that they could just take any money they wanted to, that they could lay their hands on from the Silk Road mm. and get away with it. And Tigran was the one, Tigran at IRS Criminal Investigations was the one who sat down and showed, no, look, I can see that Karl Mark Force, this DEA agent, is receiving money from the Dread Pirate Roberts. Right. You know, like nobody thought that that was possible at the, in 2014 when he did this.